Hello everybody, welcome to our lecture for this week. I really want to talk about two overlapping subjects. The first is um, the idea of temperament or um, kind of innate personality. And the second is uh, um, the idea of attachment. If you think about it, um, we have a little bit of a re um, recapitulation of the nature slash nurture issue here because the idea of temperament is these inherited or um, born with personality traits and attachment clearly um, is seen in how, for instance, temperament um, of, the, of the child and the personality of the parent um, facilitates or gets in the way of attachment. The classic um, uh, delineation of uh, temperament was um, done a number of years ago by Chess and Thomas, um, two psychiatrists, and uh, they essentially identified uh, three basically um, distinct temperament types based upon a cluster of uh, behaviors and uh, responses. The first, and this is the child that if you have children in your future, um, this is the first one you want. It's the easy child. This is the child that's generally adapt, uh, adaptive, is um, generally in a good mood, smiles, um, is just an easy kid. Uh, and if you have a child like this, you think to yourself, well, what is the big deal? Anybody can parent. Um, but be careful because your second one may be the dun 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 dun, dun difficult child. This is a child that just seems to be difficult from the very beginning. They cry, they're irritable, they're um, um, resistant, they tend to have a default setting of reacting negatively. The easy and difficult child are the easiest to understand, but the third category, um, what Chess and Thomas called the slow to warm up child, is a child that's just basically um, blank somewhat blank, low activity level, low interactive um, responses, um, just just low intensity all over the place. And um, so these are the three initial um, temperaments that uh, have been described. The, <coughs> excuse me, the good news for those of you that are future parents is that uh, about 40% uh, of children are in the easy and 10% um, are difficult. So you got a four four times uh, the chance of getting an easy child as opposed to a difficult child. And then the 15% was classified as the slow to warm up. Now, that only equals 65%. So the other 35% basically were not uh, distinct enough for them to be classified as either of these three. And this is one of the criticisms of the Chess and Thomas model is that the easy, difficult, slow to warm up categories were so broad and in, and didn't incorporate one third of the children, 35%, that um, it's a little difficult to have this uh, useful in any way. Having said that, um, there is some uh, longitudinal research that has found, to the surprise of nobody, that uh, um, there does seem to be some long-term um, validity to uh, um, the slow to warm up, difficult and easy children. Difficult children are more likely to be difficult um, um, when they're older and difficult adolescents, and the same uh, with the um, easy children. Clearly, environmental factors can change that. A child may be temperamentally easy, but um, born into a situation with neglectful or abusive parents or in an environment in which um, um, healthy attachment doesn't take place, and um, they could certainly look more difficult as they had to cope with and deal with that situation as they went through their school age years. Another way of uh, looking at temperament uh, I want to just mention is um, that popularized by Jerome Kagan. Uh, and about 20 years ago or so, Kagan um, uh, presented some research in which he um, strongly connected early social responses, uh, particularly shyness with strangers, as opposed to um, children that were uh, relatively um, uh, bold in their interactions with um, adults and with strangers. And uh, he called this um, inhibition to the unfamiliar. And what he found was that children that do, that do show um, 
anxious responses or do show um, uh, somewhat um, uh, fearful responses in response to strangers, um, that, that does uh, contribute toward a stability of being a shy kid uh, later on. And um, in Kagan's model, there was uh, pretty good predictability there. So it's another way of just looking at temperament. And as you read your textbook, there are several other ways, but I just wanted to mention the, the two most uh, um, prominent ones there. Now, as we um, make some broad generalizations about temperament, as I said before, we do know that there are um, there is such a thing as temperament, and um, that temperament does seem to be somewhat stable um, over um, the the course of years. Not absolutely stable. We would expect with this nature slash nurture question that um, um, temperament um, isn't 100% predictive at birth. Um, there's going to be the shaping effects of um, environmental factors, parents, school, um, trauma, uh, and other things. And uh, so we do know, and, and we're collecting more and more data as the days go by, that there are some stabilities um, long term. And having that knowledge gives us great ability to intervene early when um, it looks like there's a cluster of variables that would make that child a little bit more at risk. Twin studies, of course, uh, um, are always valuable. And uh, again, uh, uh, Pull Pullman and others uh, have found that, um, that temperament is a, a factor. Um, our temperaments seem to be biologically based and um, at least partially somewhat uh, um, genetically based. And um, as we would expect with a moderating influence of the intervening years um, that environment has on us. Now, moving along to attachment and parenting, um, one of the things we don't think uh, too much about, but I think it's an important uh, point to make, is that you know we tend to think of parents maybe as good parents and bad parents. Um, if we're categorizing children in terms of temperament as easy, difficult, slow to warm up, but one of the factors that uh, is just um, a reality is that you get two people together and either one of them independently may um, be just fine. But when you put them together um, into this kind of dyadic uh, social interaction, we don't always um, get what uh, psychologists like to call goodness of fit. So you and I have had this experience as adults. Um, uh, you know, you meet someone and, and the person seems fine, but you, something just doesn't click between you and that person as opposed to you meet somebody else, and even if you've known them 10 minutes, just something about your goodness of fit clicks and you feel like you're just a lot closer to that person. Well, goodness of fit uh, applies to parents and their children as well. And the reality is, is that some children, some children's personalities and some of their parents' personalities don't necessarily click. Um, whereas, um, the other parent may click with the child. Um, now, this is a little disconcerting to think about that, you know, you'll be a parent and you won't really have goodness of fit with your children. And it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It just means that I, the parent has to work particularly hard to perhaps connect with a child that, that uh, doesn't have a goodness of fit with them. But knowing about goodness of fit and, and just knowing that, um, that the concept um, differs um, depending on which parent and kid you're talking about, means that if there doesn't seem to be a clicking, uh, I I know that my son, uh, my, my ex-wife, uh, when our children were smaller, I remember she said to me a couple times about my son, I just don't click with him. He just seems like so, um, ah, I don't get him. And uh, <laughs> so I suspect as we, as we talked over the years, he would have probably said the same thing. And, um, but uh, that certainly is a, an important concept. I want to talk a little bit about attachment now. Attachment is the term that we simply use to talk about close emotional bonds or connections between two or more people. Clearly, as we talk about attachment, I want to talk about it uh, developmentally here. But um, there are clearly attachments you and I um, develop as adults, and sometimes those attachments last and sometimes they don't. And there are three general overall theories of attachment, uh, um, Freud 
and um, Harlow and uh, Erickson. Um, and I'll let you read about them. Just a comment on Harlow's theory. Um, perhaps you are familiar with Harlow. He, his his uh, um, discovery in attachment theory has been very, very important. Uh, prior to Harlow, the theory was that attachment was all about who feeds you. So since we looked at mothers and mothers did just about all of the feeding of their children, it was easy to make the mistake that the attachment was perceived in terms of feeding. Well, Harlow comes along and he challenged that notion. And uh, he said, no, it's not about feeding. It's about close physical um, and then uh, emotional contact. And so he, he had these little orphan rhesus monkeys and they all had two uh, uh, fake mothers. One was a wire mother um, that, that uh, fed them. And then one was a terry cloth covered warm cozy mom. And then Harlow did a variety of, uh, um, of things to these monkeys, but one of the things he quickly discovered and, and uh, reinforced with subsequent research was that whenever the uh, monkeys were stressed, they would always immediately run to the cozy uh, terry cloth uh, mother. And uh, so Harlow's discovery was pretty important. Now, subsequent to Harlow, we want to mention uh, several other people. Another um, important figure early on was a British psychiatrist named Bowlby. Uh, he began his initial observations at orphanages in Iran. And um, we've seen these pictures of these poor children uh, coming from orphanages that haven't been held, haven't been touched haven't uh, um, been um, nurtured. And so Bowlby made some observations about um, attachment. And he basically said that as human beings, we are biologically uh, predisposed to, um, in the moments after birth, in the, in the weeks and days and months after birth, um, to form um, attachments and to form them with the individual or individuals um, that are around um, to elicit uh, that behavior from us. So the, the baby does something, cries or coos, and then the uh, adult in the room um, uh, responds, and there's a back and forth and back and forth, and over the long term, that exchange of uh, behavior with response, with uh, um, behavior response, behavior response, builds the attachment. And Bowlby said it's biologically adaptive for us to do this because if I can elicit attachments from older people who can care for me and feed me and protect me, I'm much more likely uh, to survive. So Bowlby said it's, a, it's evolutionarily adaptive uh, for attachment um, to exist. Bowlby had four stages uh, to his attachment theory, uh, and basically all these stages are is an increasing back and forth, um, an increasing recognition of the back and forth, an increasing building up of the memory of going back and forth. So phase one was birth to two months, where there's an instinctive attempt to elicit attachment um, from the baby, and then two to seven months where this attachment is going to focus on one or maybe two important figures that are there all the time and the beginning of distinguishing those important figures, mother, father, grandmother, um, doula, um, uh, nanny or whatever, from just a stranger off the street. Then from about six months to 24 months where these attachments uh, um, deepen and uh, the ability to behave and respond, respond and to behave um, increases. Um, not just uh, um, eye gazing and cooing, but now walking and playing and reading and uh, greater and greater amounts of interaction. And then phase four uh, is just um, a cognitive overlay on top of um, uh, those, those behaviors so that we start to be able to think about how the other person would feel, what they want to do as opposed to what we want to do. I like Bowlby's phases because they can really be applied to any attachment and, uh, and, and in terms of how any attachment might uh, work. But as they relate to children, I think they're, they're particularly um, useful. Another very important um, figure in a, uh, the study of attachment is Mary Ainsworth, who came up with uh, what she called the strange situation. 
uh, and the strain situation is exactly what it sounds like. You simply put a child in a strain situation um, and you, or you separate the child from their primary caretaker or you put another uh, um, have another adult walk in. In other words, put the child in a variety of situations in which they're stressed and observe how they respond. Um, what Ainsworth came up with was uh, what she called attachment styles, which were based on the strain situation. So for instance, the securely attached uh, um, child, baby or even older child, um, it, it recognizes when the parent has left and sometimes will cry. That doesn't mean um, poor attachment, but since they have a, a secure sense that the parent is coming back, they respond to the environment that way. Then insecure avoidant um, is a child that, that does not have a secure attachment with his or her mother, and so avoids the mother. Insecure resistant is the opposite. The baby clings or the child clings. And then insecure disorganized, uh, these are uh, babies or, or children that are kind of dazed and confused. I think the coolest way to observe this is if you go to a playground sometime and watch the adults, um, often parents, and the children come to the playground. What you'll see with securely attached children is that, say the adult sits down on a bench in the, in the park and um, at the, a playground in a, a park, the secure child will actually run away and play. They feel secure enough that they can run away and play. So if you're at the playground, you'll see the secure child run off, play, but every once in a while what they'll do is they'll come and initiate contact with their, their parent or the person that takes care of them. Either they'll run back almost like tag, home base, and they'll say, you know, I did this, I did that, that kid is being mean. Or let's say they're on a swing set or a slide or something like that. They'll initiate a visual contact in which they'll yell out to the parent, mom, look at me, look what I can do. That, that secure attachment, the child feels independent to go off and play, secure enough um, to go off and play, but still maintains contact. The insecure avoidant child is when the, when the child gets to the playground, the child will just run off but they don't come back and elicit uh, um, um, contact with the parent. They're not yelling to the parent, look at me, they just run off. And when the parent wants to leave, you, you have to go find them. The insecure resistant child is the child that won't run off. They'll sit and cling, they'll hold on to the leg, you know, uh, and if you, as the parent encourages them, they'll say, no, I wanna stay by you. And the insecure disorganized child doesn't have any really sense of things. There seems to be combinations of that. And so every time I go to a playground, I'll just observe uh, um, adults and children, and it's kind of easy to see these kind of things um, that would really reflect Ainsworth's attachment styles. Uh, the thing that's important about Ainsworth's attachment style is not only she, but plenty of other people. Uh, so you can see here in the middle of the slide, Bretherton and Brish, and um, uh, plenty of other research has found that uh, attachment early on seems to be to foreshadow or seems to be somewhat predictive of healthy attachments later on. Uh, so for instance, there's some research even to indicate that poor attachment in childhood um, um, increases the likelihood that that person will have fewer friends in high school, is more likely to have uh, um, to, to uh, get divorced, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty important concept, and uh, as you'll read in the textbook, there is some debate about it, but um, um, it is, at least at this point, seems to be relatively uh, predictive. And as you would expect, um, it's not only that uh, attachment um, styles in children, but um, what we've uh, studied is the uh, attachments, um, can we put them caregiving styles in parents that seem to elicit um, the attachment styles in children. So securely attached to babies, infants, even school-aged children seem to have caregivers who are emotionally sensitive to the needs of the child and um, relatively available to respond to their needs. So the child learns, okay, when I have a need and I communicate it, I, I'm gonna get some kind of response. 
On the other hand, insecurely attached babies, um, caregivers, often do not, they either ignore their baby signals, they have little physical contact with them. Um, there's really no glue to the attachment. Um, the resistant babies, um, caregivers, tend to be have a style which is inconsistent all over the place, sometimes responding, sometimes over-responding, sometimes not responding at all. So the child has no predictive um, idea to be able to uh, build their, their uh, uh, um, responses on. And finally, disorganized babies, caregivers, are often the ones that are abusive either emotionally, physically, um, or sexually. And those children, as you would expect, over the long term, have by far the greatest uh, uh, um, uh, amount of uh, problems um, reflected from these attachment styles.